Welcome to Executive Function 101. Today we'd like to give you some background on executive functions, provide you with tips and strategies to help your students improve their organizational and study strategies, and share some of the systems we have in school to support students in their executive functioning and academics. I'm David Hain, MTSS Coordinator at Lake Forest High School. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tracy Rourke, and I'm the Director of Student Services for Lake Bluff School District 65. I'm Marissa Cadenice, the Executive Functioning Specialist at Deer Path Middle School in District 67. There's a lot that can fit under the umbrella of executive functions, so here are the core principles we will cover tonight. An overview of executive functions, materials organization, record keeping, study strategies, and time management. Executive functions comprise the set of cognitive processes that have been developed over the course of millions of years to deal with problems, plan ahead, and regulate emotions like anxiety, panic, and anger. Sometimes it's helpful to think of executive functions in anatomical terms. The amygdala is part of the brain's limbic system and, among other things, it is responsible for the reactions we feel when we are threatened and for the fight-flight-freeze responses. From an evolutionary perspective, it's an ancient anatomical structure that has been with us for a very long time. And the further forward you go anatomically, the more modern your brain gets, with the prefrontal cortex housing those parts of ourselves that reason and plan. Unfortunately, the anatomical perspective isn't always that much help. You can't, for example, flex your prefrontal cortex or ask your limbic system to calm down. So here's how I like to think of it. There are some traits that humans possess that we share with more ancient creatures and others that are purely our own. When we work with students, we might call these the lizard parts of the brain and the executive parts of the brain. And it's helpful to list the things that lizard brains can accomplish compared to what a human brain can accomplish. These are real responses from Lake Forest High School students to this exact question. Students will identify that the lizard brain, which lives inside of each of us, has basic needs and responses that they themselves often feel, and that the executive brain, which also lives inside each of us, is responsible for most of the things we value in an academic environment, including the ability to manage and match behavior and emotions to a situation or task. The image you see in this slide is a visual representation of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is an idea formulated by American psychologist Abraham Maslow. Maslow developed his hierarchy of needs in the course of studying human development and motivation. And his theory essentially posits that there are universal human needs and that people are motivated to engage in behaviors that help these needs be met. In the image you see before you on the screen, you'll notice that these needs are organized into a pyramid. The pyramid represents the idea that some needs are more foundational than others, that certain needs must be met at least partially before the quote unquote higher level motivations can be accessed. So starting from the bottom, we have the physiological needs, things like getting food, water, sleep, and shelter. Then we have safety needs, followed by the need to feel loved and a sense of belonging. Above that, we have esteem needs. And these bottom four rows or needs make up what we call the deficiency needs. These are the needs that when they're not met, impair our functioning and make it more difficult for us to be motivated towards those higher level needs, towards growth and self-actualization, which is basically a fancy psychological term for striving to be the best that we can and to meet our potential. Um, now looking at these needs, these deficiency needs, the bottom ones, in practice we can all see how this makes sense. For example, if you're starving or dying of thirst, you're probably not going to be spending a whole lot of your time, energy, effort on trying to be a better person. You're just going to be focused on how are you going to survive? How are you going to get food or water? Um, then, so if we move up, the next four are cognitive and aesthetic needs, self-actualization, and transcendence. 
Now, Maslow's hierarchy is important in the context of executive functioning because these top half, these growth needs, are where executive functions are required the most. Our deficiency needs, those bottom four, are things that our lizard brains, as David put it, are perfectly capable of doing. Our lizard brains, our lower um, brain systems, are perfectly capable of helping us to find food and water and shelter. That's not unique to humans. All species do it. But growing our abilities, working towards goals, those types of things require focus, organization, planning, control of emotions, flexible thinking, changing behaviors, and all of those things fall under the context of executive functioning. What are executive functions? Well, executive functions are the habits and skills that allow kids to accomplish their goals. These habits and skills include organization, planning and prioritization, working memory, self-monitoring, emotional control, cognitive flexibility, and task initiation. The first concept we're going to talk about is materials organization. This is keeping track of the things you need in and out of school in order to complete your work tasks or daily life activities. At the elementary school level, you may see students organizing materials in a variety of ways. In some classrooms, students may keep materials in shared supply bins, some students may keep their materials in a desk or a cubby. Students may have a variety of different colored folders to keep papers organized. At home, you may want to consider creating a space for your child to keep their backpack and school supplies. It's helpful if they always know to put their supplies in the same spot each day. That way, it's easier to access those supplies when they're needed. It's also helpful to create a routine for unpacking and packing up their backpack so that each day when they come home, they can unpack and take out their needed materials and pack up their backpack each morning in preparation for school so they don't forget any of the materials they had taken out the day before. Materials organization at the middle school level looks like this. At school, students are provided explicit instruction during homeroom to organize their supplies, lockers, and backpacks while incorporating the four C's of organization strategy. For supplies, students are shown organizational systems to keep track of their materials and set themselves up for a successful school year. Under the supplies umbrella falls paper organization. Students choose among one of three systems to organize their papers. These systems include an accordion folder, an individual color coordinated folders and matching notebooks for each class, or a big binder with dividers for each class. A homework folder is also part of the supply umbrella. Students selected one two pocket folder and labeled it homework. Inside the folder, one pocket is labeled to do and the other pocket is labeled done, just like the picture on the bottom left of this slide. Continuing under the supply umbrella is labels. Students labeled all school supplies with their first and last name using a Sharpie. Pencil organization, pencil case organization is the last part of the supply umbrella. Students place glue sticks, highlighters, pens, pencils, earbuds, sharpies, erasers, colored pencils, pencil sharpeners, and regular pencils in their pencil case. For lockers, students have a goal that every paper and material will have a spot and that materials can be found quickly and easily. To assist with this goal, students viewed pictures of several organized lockers, like the one shown on the middle of this slide, and discussed the organizational elements of each locker that would make life easier. For backpacks, students are encouraged to put post-it notes and calculators in the front pocket of their backpack, while folders, notebooks, books, iPad, and lunch are placed in the main large pocket. Supplies, lockers, and backpacks can all be organized using the four C's of organization strategy, which looks like this. Clean, 
customize, categorize, and continue. Middle school students reference the strategy throughout the year to stay organized with their supplies, lockers, and backpacks. In addition to materials organization at school, there are ways to support this at home. First is to set up a homework spot with office materials readily available. A supply caddy might be helpful too. Next, items around the house should have designated places. For example, kids should know that their iPad charger always remains in the same spot where they do their homework. This way, they can easily charge their device and be prepared for school the next day. Another idea is that when middle schoolers are doing an activity like baking or food making, reinforce the importance of cleaning up and putting away all items to back to the correct spots. Cleaning up can also be a game. Encourage kids to listen to music while tidying up their rooms, or if the basement needs to be picked up, then have the kids clean up the amount of items for their age. For example, a 12-year-old can put away 12 items. Lastly, feel free to incorporate the four C's of organization strategy, clean, customize, categorize, and continue for closets, for closet cleanouts, bathroom cabinets, or even for kids' sports bags for af- that they use for after-school activities. In the high school, many things depend on computers. A student who forgets their laptop or who arrives with the battery uncharged will have a challenging day. Then there's the backpack. Some students use their lockers to stow and retrieve materials, but more students carry everything with them to each class. For that reason, it's helpful to periodically do what we call a backpack purge throwing away papers we don't need, and organizing materials that we want to keep. Having color-coded folders and notebooks help keeps notes organized and paper documents separated. There's a lot of conflicting research into the best ways and places to study when you're at home. It's important to find a location that is free from distractions, but not too quiet, comfortable, but not sleep-inducing, and close to food and sources of encouraging support. The kitchen table is sometimes a good choice. It's a good idea to structure study time into chunks, which we'll talk about later. But if they can, it's best if students reserve cell phone use for break times. When we think of record keeping, we think of keeping track of our homework assignments or our grades. There are a few executive functions that work together when we think about record keeping. These are organization, planning and prioritizing, and self-monitoring. When it comes to record keeping, there are also several strategies we employ at school and a few things parents can do at home. In terms of what we do at school, students track their homework and assignments as they move through the grades. In the younger grades, they do it one day at a time, but then by grade three, students start tracking their assignments weekly, and in grades four and five, students begin to really use that planner more independently. At home, you can help your child with record keeping by helping them to prioritize their assignments, walking through those hidden steps of assignments. Um, So that's like getting things set up, making sure you have all your materials, doing steps that they might forget, for example, in math. Um, And then that final thing that parents can do to support I'm going to have to start again because that pop up. At the elementary level, there's a few different things that we do for record keeping. At school, students track their homework, and this develops throughout the grades in terms of what's expected of them. In the younger grades, they start with just tracking things one day at a time, but then by grades three, students move on to tracking things more on a weekly basis. And then moving into grades four and five, we expect students to learn how to use a planner and really start to develop some more independence with record keeping and assignment tracking. At home, you can support your students in developing their record keeping skills by supporting them and prioritizing their assignments, helping your child talk through the hidden steps of an assignment, like making sure they have all the materials they need, making sure they don't skip steps, making sure they turn it in if it's a digital assignment. And then also just making sure that your child has a space for all the needed materials they need to complete their homework. 
Record keeping at the middle school level looks like this. Students use planners, PowerSchool, Schoology, and communication tools such as Schoology Messenger or Gmail. Students are provided explicit instruction during homeroom to utilize a planner system that works best for them to achieve their goals. Students know that planners are tools to manage their time with assignments, quizzes, tests, or other responsibilities. Some students prefer physical planners, such as the DPM Student Planner, a blank journal to be individually formatted, or pre-made planners from Amazon or Office Max. Other students prefer electronic planners that can be created on Google Docs, Google Slides, Notability, or Google Calendar. Even if assignments are posted on Schoology, students should copy these assignments into their planners. This is because the act of writing or typing the assignment commits it to memory, and writing or typing the assignment during class allows students to ask their teachers or classmates any clarifying questions they might have. In addition to planners, PowerSchool is another form of record keeping. PowerSchool is an app for tracking core classes, encore classes, individual grades, and attendance, such as tar tardies or absences. In the, middle, in the middle school, students have access to PowerSchool at all times since the app, which looks like the image in the middle of this slide, is preloaded on their iPads. When students view their individual class grades, it's important to note that many times assignment names also include icons. The icon and their descriptors sh shown at the bottom of this slide can be seen in PowerSchool. For example, let's say a student clicks on their Living Systems Lab assignment for science, and the student notices that the assignment has a small speech bubble next to its name. This means that the science teacher has included a comment for that assignment. The comment might read, well done with your observations, or it might also read, please complete the second page and resubmit by next week. Either way, students are highly encouraged to click on the comment to see their teacher's feedback. Form of record keeping is Schoology. Schoology is an app for class resources such as daily slides, video links, assignment links, discussion boards, homework, study guides, and quiz and test dates. Like PowerSchool, students have access to Schoology at all times since the app, which looks like the image on the left of this slide, is preloaded on their iPads. Schoology also includes a digital calendar with assignments and important events like tests or quiz dates. The, the information on this calendar should be copied into students' planners. The last form of record keeping is communication tools, such as Schoology Messenger or Gmail. If students have questions about their assignments or they just want to let their teacher know that they submitted an assignment, then they can message their teacher within the Schoology app by clicking on the envelope. DPM students also have Gmail accounts, so they also have the option to email their teachers. It's important for students to make sure they check their Schoology messages and emails as well. In addition to record keeping at school, there are also ways to support record keeping at home. One way is to use a large family calendar for, to document events and activities for the week and month. This way, everyone knows what's coming up. Next is chore charts. These could be small whiteboards that list each family member's responsibilities for the week. A third way is to ask your middle schooler to show you his or her planner. If the planner is complete, then your child is set for the week. If the planner is blank, then encourage your child to copy the assignments from Schoology into his or her planner. A really great feature of both PowerSchool and Schoology is the parent access. Yes, parents can view the same information as their kids with the parent access feature of these apps. If you need assistance getting set up, then please let me know and I can assist you. Parents have the option to set up alerts and notifications within the apps to see grades, absences, and any other information shown from PowerSchool or Schoology. Lastly, if your child needs clarification with an assignment while working on it, then please encourage him or her to communicate this to his or her teacher through the Schoology Messenger or Gmail while at home.
The best way to keep on top of academics in a high school is to write everything down. Every day, students should do what we call a Schoology Power School Sync. In other words, they should use the calendar function in Schoology to write any upcoming or missing assignments into a physical planner or journal. An assignment notebook or journal is also useful because it allows students to jot down assignments that aren't listed in Schoology. Once a student gets home, they should use their assignment notebook or journal to list or highlight the assignments that have to get done today, which assignments need to be started today but completed later, and which assignments can safely be left until later. When we think about study strategies, we think about test taking. We use a number of executive functions when it comes to study strategies. This would be task initi initiation, planning and prioritizing, and self-monitoring. We utilize these executive functions in order to help us plan, prepare, and study for assessments or school work throughout the day. Okay, when we're talking study strategies at the elementary level, there's a few different things that we do at school. One thing we teach students is to highlight keywords and questions, highlight, circle, underline, Students also self-correct their assignments and homework so that they can learn what they know and what they need to continue um, working on. We have students write study reminders in their planners prior to tests so that they remember to study. And then as they move into the older elementary grades, we even employ study guides. Um, at home, you can support your students with their study strategies by doing things like playing math workplace games, helping them practice reflex or making time for them to practice reflex, talking about homework assignments with your student, and even asking your student what they learned at school and having them explain it to you. Here's what study strategies look like at the middle school level. Classroom teachers provide students with physical study guides or digital copies that can be found on Schoology course pages. Middle school students are also assigned specific practice problems to review for tests and quizzes. This way, students have a streamlined set of problems to try on their own. These practice problems are typically found on the classroom resources section of course Schoology pages. Another strategy is class review games such as Kahoots and Gimkits. Again, the links to these digital activities can be found on the Schoology course page. Lastly, students can use the quiz feature and review activities on brainpop.com to review topics discussed in class. In addition to study strategies at school, there are also ways to support at home. One way is for students to check their Schoology calendars for test and quiz dates when they come home from school. Then, students should record these tests and quiz dates into their planners. By knowing these dates, students can then plan backwards and chunk their study time. It's also helpful for students to see if they have multiple tests or quizzes on the same day. Let's say they have a Spanish test on Friday as well as a social studies quiz. Students can plan backwards and chunk their time like this. Monday is 20 minutes Spanish, Tuesday 20 minutes social studies, Wednesday and Thursday are 10 minutes of social studies and 10 minutes of Spanish. This setup prepares kids for Friday in a balanced way. Besides backwards planning and chunking time into manageable parts, another study strategy is that, that middle schoolers can use is to teach you, another family member, friends, or a neighbor about a topic they're learning in school. Students can select a few questions or prompts from their class notes or study guides and thoroughly explain each step. If you or the other person needs clarification, then have your child stop, re-explain, and even look back at old material to further clarify. Acronyms are another study strategy that can be used at home. Students can write down acronyms such as HOMES to help remember names of the Great Lakes. It's also helpful for students to incorporate movement into their study routine. For example, students can sit down and study for 20 minutes, 
go out and rollerblade for 20 minutes, and then come back to their studying. This helps students sustain attention and retain their information. The last strategy to use at home is called sweeten the task. This means to pair an undesirable ta task with a desirable one. For example, if your child doesn't like to do math homework, then pair it with a cup of hot cocoa in a cozy spot. This can make the undesirable task much more desirable. There's seemingly no end to the systematic study strategies a student can adopt, but there are a few tried and tested methods that are well researched or have stood the test of time. Firstly, students can Firstly, students can consider hmm. There's seemingly no end to the systematic study strategies a student can adopt. But there are a few tried and tested methods that are well researched or have stood the test of time. Firstly, students can consider that time spent in class is two to three times more valuable in terms of content mastery than solitary study time. So don't waste it. Take outline notes in class and finish homework on time so you're ready for tests and quizzes. Use your PLT time weekly and remember that resource centers are available during all study halls and before and after school to help students study or master tricky material. When you're studying at home, make a schedule and stick to it and try using academic spacing. Set a timer and spend 20 minutes working hard on your academics, then take a mandatory 5 to 10 minute break with a bite to eat and full cell phone privileges. Then put the cell phone away and get back to work for another 20 minutes. When you do your homework, have a notebook by your side, writing down problems or concepts you sh When you do your homework, have a notebook by your side, writing down problems or concepts that you aren't sure about. Then self-test. Use old homework or note cards to create a test that you give to yourself. Once you've mastered a concept, series of vocabulary words or math skills, remove them from the test. Repeat the process until you've mastered everything. Finally, use your study guides. Mastering the material on a study guide is as close as you can come to knowing ahead of time what will be on the test. Time management is the ability to set an, a beginning and an ending time for a task, to know about the passage of time, how long things take to complete. Oftentimes, children struggling with executive functions have a hard time planning and managing time. There's many skills that go into time management, such as organization, planning and prioritizing, self-monitoring, and impulse control. All right, time management. At the elementary level, there's a few different things we do for time management. Teachers use timers in their classrooms to help students keep track of their work time. They write their schedule for the day on the whiteboard. They ask students to estimate how long homework or assignments will take them. Um, and they discuss scheduling. So if they have an assignment that's due in two days, are you going to have time to do it tonight? Are you going to have time to do it tomorrow? When are you going to get time to get it done? At home, there's a few things you can do to support your students. Number one is let your students teach, teacher know. Let's cut it there. At home, there's a few different things you can do to help your students. You can let your students teacher know if their homework is taking too long, because there may be a problem with time management if that's the case. You can ask your child to estimate how long an activity will take, and then when the activity is done, see if it took more or less time than they expected. And then one final thing you can do is when your student's working on homework, set timers so they can get an idea of how much time it might take them and whether it takes more or less time than expected. Here are some ways time management is taught at the middle school. First, many teachers use daily or weekly agendas to display at the front of the room. These agendas provide students with a breakdown of tasks for that class, and they're also digitally available on Schoology course pages. Not only do the agendas include activities for that specific class period, 
but they also include homework and upcoming important dates. Students also use checklists or rubrics for time management so they're aware of the expectations to complete assignments on time. In addition to checklists, another strategy is timers. Teachers display digital timers on their projectors for various in-class activities. Students can also use timers on their iPads when working independently or in small groups. Middle schoolers can furthermore manage their time by reducing distractions at school. For example, they can partner up with a classmate who is a positive peer role model. This way, they can be most productive with their time. Lastly, middle schoolers prioritize tasks by numbering the tasks in their planners. The numbers indicate the order that the tasks will be completed. In addition to time management strategies at school, there's also ways to support at home. One way is for kids to know the, their circadian rhythm. They can identify a time of day when they feel good. For example, some middle schoolers may feel productive right after an after-school snack, whereas others may feel this way after baseball practice or other after-school commitments. When kids feel good, they're more productive to get work done. Like school, another at-home strategy is to set a timer on the iPad. Kids choose the amount of time they would like to work on homework. When the timer goes off, they can take a break and then repeat the timer. Middle schoolers can also reflect on their after-school actions and behaviors. Are these actions and behaviors wasting time or using time? Texting and playing video games would be wasting time, whereas reading a book and packing their backpacks and after-school bags for the next day would be using time. Reducing time-wasting actions and behavior and replacing them with time-using actions and behaviors help kids make the most of their day. Just like at school, kids can also prioritize tasks by numbering the tasks in their planners when they get home. This way, kids have a definite plan for completing these tasks based on the number order. It's also helpful for middle school students to establish morning and nighttime routines, such as the morning routine checklists, checklist that's located in the middle of this slide. Routines allow kids to feel prepared and be on time. Lastly, middle schoolers can estimate the amount of time tasks should take them. They can write these estimations next to the assignment in their Remembering that any time you spend productively in school is time you can spend. Remembering that any time you save by spending. Remembering that any time you save by being productive in school is time you can spend having fun out of school. Use proven study strategies in class and don't squander your study hall time. Go to the resource centers if you need help with material or just want to focus. Start your work now and think of your future self. What would the you in a few hours say to the you sitting in class? Probably pay attention and get your work done. When you're at home, be realistic about how much work you have and how much time it will take you to complete it. Make a specific plan down to the minute if you have to and stick to it. Use academic spacing to create an on-off schedule and make breaks mandatory. It's hard to get going on the weekends, so identify a homework start time and tell that time to someone else so they can help you be accountable. Start now. There's no benefit to waiting. And once again, think of your future self. Consider what the you of Monday morning would ask the you of Saturday morning or Sunday morning to do. So, on behalf of your future self, start work early and push hard taking breaks every 20 minutes until it's all done so the you from the future won't have to stress out because the you from the present didn't get down to work. We've thrown a lot of information at you in this presentation, so we wanted to take a slide here at the end to give you a few quick tips on how to support your child's executive functioning. Number one, make sure your student has a fitness routine and that it includes aerobic activity. That's things that we usually call cardio, things like running, biking, swimming, jump roping. 
Studies show that there's a strong connection between physical activity and executive functioning, and experimental studies have demonstrated that increased levels of exercise and physical fitness cause executive functioning to improve. The opposite is also true, by the way. Sedentary patterns of behavior and lack of physical activity have been linked to poorer executive functioning performance. Number two, make sure your child is getting enough sleep and help minimize non-essential screen time. 73%, or the vast majority of all children in the United States, are not getting enough sleep each night, and looking at screens before bed only further impairs their sleep quality and quantity. Sleep deficits, in turn, impair executive functioning and put students at greater risk for negative outcomes or issues, such as mood disorders and lack of academic progress. On the flip side, brain studies show that when children are getting adequate sleep, their brains are replaying the information they learn throughout the day and strengthening the associated connections in their cortex. Number three. Remember that stress impairs executive functioning and help your students practice coping with stress. For example, practicing mindfulness has been found to improve impulse and emotional control, foster higher level thinking skills such as metacognition, and build resilience to stress. Number four, praise your student when they practice executive functioning skills. Executive functioning takes place in the prefrontal cortex of the brain which is full of dopamine neurons. This means that when students are rewarded or praised for practicing these skills, the neurons will grow stronger and more connected. Nonverbal praise, such as high fives, thumbs up, and hugs, are especially effective for this because studies show that nonverbal praise helps students remember experiences better and also improves their self-confidence more than verbal praise. Finally, number five, Consider having your student take up an instrument. Studies show that music education improves executive functioning, much like increased fitness and better sleep. We want to thank you for listening to our executive functioning presentation. If you would like some more support for your child and you live in Lake Bluff, please reach out to Tim Burks at tburks at lb65.org, Tracy Rorick at trorick at lb65.org, or Karen Swanson at cswanson at lb65.org. If you have a child in Lake Bluff or Lake Forest School District 67, you can reach out to Marissa Cantonese at mcantonese at lfschools.net. And if you have a child that attends Lake Forest High School, you can use the QR code on this presentation to request extra support. Thank you so much.